Hello, hello, hello. It's Stephanie here. Welcome back to the Red to Red Success podcast. You are so lucky because you are here. It's episode 118 and we have a true Red to Red rock star for you today. Evie Stockford has joined us and Evie is only 23 and she has 16 rent to rent properties. Yes, one six. She's got six HMOs and 10 service accommodation. This is a busy woman. But I love hearing stories how people got started, how people got over their fears, and how people came to such success, especially so early on. So Evie Stockford, welcome to the show. Hello, Stephanie. Thank you for having me and inviting me on to, to talk with you today. Yeah, it's it's brilliant. It's brilliant to have you here. And um, before I even go on, I need to tell you because I know that you are going to want more of Evie. And Evie has her own blog and it's called That Property Girl Evie. I will put it on the screens, uh, screen even now so that you can see it if you're watching on the website. And Evie's also on Instagram at, the, at that property girl Evie. So Evie, I would love it if you could please tell us how does a 23 year old become to managing 16 properties what made you want to get started yeah of course so basically i suppose from quite a young age i'd always decided that i wanted to own my own business and work for myself um but i just never knew how or what i wanted to do and it was like we were on a dog walk my partner and i and he was scrolling on facebook and he stumbled across a rent to rent seminar advert I don't know why it was very random um, and we decided you know what why not let's just let's go for it and it was a free seminar in London with someone called Paul Preston who um, is experienced in the property world and so we booked it and we went which was all out of character to be honest like it was really strange like when I look back and I obviously get asked the question a lot how did I start it's really weird because when I think of it it's just so out of character everything that happened um, so we went to the seminar that was in London and he like spoke about rent to rent and different strategies, so buy to lets and flips and everything. And he was, the reason it was free because he was then selling on his course for rent to rent and different things. But we just went just to get knowledge because we had never heard of rent to rent before we'd been there. Um, and then it kind of spiraled from there. So I thought, you know what, actually, this is a good way to become self-employed and to have a business. And it was kind of a passion that I didn't really know that I had. And so then we started researching it. So after the seminar, I went on YouTube, I looked up magazines, I was on Instagram, everything I could do that was property related. Like I just researched absolutely everything because I had no understanding or knowledge in that area. And so I found people through PIN. So like every month there's like a local PIN and it's like people who are in property go there and they discuss like all of their tips, what they do, and they might advertise what, what they're doing in property. So I went there each month and met loads of like-minded people. And I also met people through like magazines, on Facebook, networking, and then just went from there. And so I went to the seminar in January. And we picked up our first rent to rent HMO in the April, um, all just through research and talking to people who have done it. And then it just went from there, really. So we got the first deal, and then that deal kind of spiralled on to the others, and that's obviously where we're we're at now. Um, and that was four years ago in eight, the April coming up. Yeah, and that's amazing because so many people like you, Evie, I get so many messages from people saying, "Oh, I've read your book, and now I've got my first deal," or "I got your, you know, contracts or letters, and now I've got my first deal," or "I've been following you on YouTube or the podcast." This podcast, honestly. Yeah. It's such an inspiration to people hearing stories like yours and picking up tips of how different people did it as well. You start, yeah, of course. So I'd love to go on to, Evie, how you got started because you went to that seminar, but you know what? A lot of people go to seminars and yeah. have the idea. And when you're in the room, there's all the excitement and the drama yeah. and yeah. go home and it's really easy to be confused and not know what to do and to be a bit scared and then not really move forward so how did you translate all that energy and excitement from the day to your yeah, life yeah i suppose 
because I was so determined before the seminar, so before I even knew about Rent Instrument, I was just so determined that I wanted to have my own business. I think that determination just took over. So once I knew there was people who were young, um, who had done Rent to Rent, and I could see how possible it was, I thought, you know what, there's no going back now. Like, this is what I'm going to do. And because I could see other people have been successful, I thought there is no reason why I can't be that person. And I think that drive and determination just become um, important. I managed, like that helped me to just keep going. And I, that's how I think I, how I got there. I love that. And you know what? This is something I'm talking about more and more because I see such a distinction within our students. It's yeah. so normal and human to think about all the reasons you can't do it, but you had a thought that kept you going. Yeah. And that was looking at other people and thinking, there's no reason why I can't do this. That's so powerful. That's yeah, that's it. I just thought if someone else has done it and they're successful from it, why can't can't I be that person? Yeah, totally. So let's break it down a bit. You got this first HMO. Tell us, how did you get it? What, what term strategies? Yeah. yeah, of course. So basically, from the seminar, I kind of just... I message like on Gumtree, you can message and also directly on open rent. And also I contacted a local estate agents just trying to explain like what it is we do and what kind of properties we were looking for. And so our first deal actually came from the estate agent. But there were so many no's before that first yes, because I think a lot of people think it's going to be easy, people are going to say yes. And then as soon as someone says no, they they stop and lose faith in it. But you have to remember, like, I had so many no's before I got that first yes. But if you had to put a me. number on it, Evie, oh, if you had to put a number on it, Evie, how many no's did you get before the first yes? Oh, so many, like I over 50 no's, like there is so many. And is um, that from messages, from messages online, from telephone calls, from visits? That's it, it's from like, through estate agents or even if the estate agent had said yes and then we went and viewed the property I might then put in an offer and then the landlord actually say no because they weren't happy with it or on Gumtree people will just say no to you straight away or open rent or when you're on the call trying to explain it people say no they don't feel comfortable with it and I think looking back in hindsight obviously you're always going to get no no matter how confident you are and no matter how long you've been doing it I think especially yeah. where obviously I was quite new to it I wasn't 100% sure on what I was saying mm. so I kind of just went for it whereas now I get more yeses purely probably just because I know what I'm saying I've got a mm. reputation and it makes it easier whereas that mm. first one just takes that little bit more courage to keep going yeah um, but yeah I got it through an estate agent um, and the landlord was pretty easy going they just wanted like a hands-off um, investment that they didn't really mind who had the property as long as it was being looked after um, so I took it on and that deal actually probably is not the best deal I've ever done um, but it got me started um, but basically so I had to actually put six months up front for the landlord and the estate agent to take me on that was something I had to make myself appealing to them for them to understand and want to work with me so I actually put six months up front. I can't remember the exact amount, but it wasn't a little amount. It was quite it was quite a big chunk. And then I also put down the deposit. Um, and I think if maybe I hadn't have done that, I wouldn't have got that deal. I had to try and make myself as appealing as possible. Um, and I think that's what, what helped, was that I could offer those things. I really like that. You made yourself as appealing as possible. It was like a total no-brainer to go with you. So oh, did yeah. you suggest that, Evie, the six months up front? Uh, yeah, I can't quite remember how it happened. I think it was potentially they didn't say yes, like, straight away. They were open to it, and I did the viewing, and then I think they were, like, I'm an ring or potentially had other offers. And that's when I thought, how am I going to push them over the edge to come with me? Um, and that's when I decided to do the six months up front and then obviously they, they took it. Um, obviously not everybody can do that and I don't necessarily advise to do that. It's just that's the way it worked for me and I think that helped me get that deal. And then since, although that's not, sorry, although that's not the best deal, I think since then, that then helped me get the second and the third because once yes. you have that one and you're over the line, it gets you that reputation. People then trust you and understand you've got another landlord and another estate agent who have worked with you. So why wouldn't they? 
um and it really that just really helped like grow the business yeah I love that um it just reminds me of when Conrad Guider was on and he did so many different things and it was just so interesting but what you're saying is as you said you offered six months because you just thought you know what I want this I want to seal the deal but somebody could equally offer two months or three months or they could offer something else that's um that's a plus just to get your foot in the door for your first deal so what you're saying Evie is that your first deal wasn't so great on the cash flow front um but did did it it did make money did it yeah, it did. It made me around, uh, kind of just now in hindsight, that's all, but it made me around 500 a month, mm. which is good. Um, mm. It's just now, obviously, I have multiple deals. I can see the potential other ones can give me. Um, yes. So it was good, but it's in hindsight, it probably wasn't my strongest. But obviously, where it's your first, you don't always, you know what you're doing, but yeah. not to the extent I know now. Yeah. Um, and also, I suppose it was out of all of them, it was the weakest location. It was yeah. only four bedrooms. There's lot, lots of weak parts to it, which I now see. Yeah. But well done, because you did it. You got £500 a month out of it. Eventually, you paid yourself back from all the months of rent yeah. that you paid up, because obviously, you then didn't need to pay rent. You, um, pay you could yeah. just keep everything up, up until... And, and that initial contract, how, long, how many years was it for? It was three years. Um, mm. So I secured it for three years, because I kind of thought if I'm going to invest into this, I want it to be a long-term thing. I do want mm. to put all my time and effort into it and only have it for a year. Whereas if I had it for three years, it kind of would pay off um, mm. and work for me. So what I would love to know, Evie, is what is your top tip from getting your first deal from a letting agent like you did? If somebody is yeah. listening and thinking, well, um, maybe we've got people listening and they're 23 and they think, oh my gosh, Evie's been doing this. Is it three years, yeah. Evie? Um, it'll be four years in April. You've been doing this for four years and, and they get they get inspired and think, do you know what, I'm going to try it. What, 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 what advice would you give them for getting deals from letting agents? Yeah, I would say just go for it and also come across quite confident. So what I did was I really, for example, because it was a HMO and in Oxford there's quite strict HMO regulations. I really decided, right, I'm going to hammer in on understanding those things. So all of the HMO regulations and licenses and everything like that, I really researched so that when I then approached um, estate agents, I could, I sounded as though I probably had more knowledge than I did um, because I knew that specific area. And because I'd researched it a lot, I sounded quite confident and like I knew what I was talking about. And I think making sure you know enough and you also you, you don't know what an estate agent is going to ask you, but you have an idea of what they're going to ask you. So I think if you've made sure you plan all of your answers to their potential questions and you come, come across quite confident and know what you're on about, I think it helps them like understand you and also believe in you a little bit more. So rather than being like stuttering, not knowing what you're saying, if you know what you're saying and you sound confident with it, they're going to believe in you. I think this is so powerful. I'm going to ask you another question, Evie, because we have a website. It's called renttorentsuccess.com slash ask, where people can record questions for me to answer. And one of the recent ones, which will be episode 80A45, was about what to say when they say to you, have you got ex- any experience? So that was exactly your situation. On the very yeah. first one, you were 19 uh, you were doing yeah. it for the first time. And how did you answer? Did anybody ask you? And mm-hmm. how did you answer? No, I suppose I never got asked, do I have experience? I don't even know if they really asked me whether I had any other properties. It was just once I had one, I made sure I mentioned that I already had one. But to get that first one, I don't remember them ever saying, do you have any that you already do this with? But what you could do is say, I didn't do any property training, but say you have done property training or you have done a course, you could always bring that and to your advantage and say, well, I have done this and you've got this training. Or you could potentially look to seek different qualifications within that area if you felt you needed that. I personally don't have any of that and didn't need it. Um, but I can't really remember the exact questions I was asked. But yeah, I would just say if you don't have any properties and you don't have that experience, maybe you could explain that you do have this course and you are you have got this qualification, et cetera, et cetera. And that could help um, build your report for state agents or potential landlords. 
Absolutely. And some of our Kickstarters definitely leverage on the fact that they've done the training with HMO Heaven. They've done the training. Yeah, that's but, it. But like you, Evie, I find you don't actually need it. And people don't actually believe me when I say most landlords and mm. some letting agents don't actually ask you, what is your experience to do this? No, because they don't. They buy into what you think about yourself. And so yeah. another really important point, as you said, Evie, is to rehearse your answers to the basic questions yeah. about why you're amazing and just to yeah. <laughs> sell, sell yourself first so that yeah, you're really right. bought in. So um, thank you for that. Any tips, Evie, on negotiation? Because obviously, although you think now it's not one of your best deals, but it was a good deal to start with because four beds and to get 500 a month profit is actually, yeah. I think, pretty yeah, decent. No, it's not bad. Yeah, I would say negotiation actually is still my weakest point. Um, I'm quite, I don't really have any like top tips for how to negotiate the best deal. Um, I would say... Go in there, being confident, sell, sell yourself and what you're going to do and explain to them what benefits you have over a standard tenant. And that can help you negotiate because say you're going to offer to refurb at the start or paint at the start, then you can use that to then potentially knock off rent or knock off your first month's rental payment and stuff like that. That could be a way that you can negotiate. But to be honest with myself, I don't have many tips that I know definitely would work <laughs> yeah and the other thing that people worry about Evie is uh, the startup costs and you had quite significant startup costs because you offered that so how did you raise the money to get to get started yeah. yeah so basically since my partner and I turned 18 we both went into full-time employment because we knew we wanted to save for our first property that for us to live in um and so at 19 we'd actually had quite a chunk saved up for our own house so we decided instead of buying our own house first, we're going to use that money for the rent to rent business. Um, and that's the only reason why I had quite a chunk saved up already. Because obviously, if I hadn't have done that, I probably I wouldn't be able to have afforded to have paid the six months on the deposit. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, it is good to obviously have savings. But also some people I know have done their first deals and they haven't needed any upfront um, yeah. costs. So it just depends and varies on the deal. And as you're growing, because, you know, we talked about at the start, you've got 16 properties now. I'm guessing yeah. some of them would have needed a refurb. Are you getting private investment or are you still funding it all through your own yeah. business? Yes, we've always funded it through our own business because what we've always done is usually any money made, we put back into the business and that's kind of how we've grown. But to be honest, we've been quite lucky. We haven't really had to do any refurbs or big jobs when we take on properties we've always quite specifically looked for ones that were quite easy and they didn't um, require a big payment up front so apart from say deposits if you have a deposit there wasn't actually many upfront costs um, I suppose the only ones we have had is when you've had to obviously like furnish the whole property and say it's a holiday let you want it to quite a high standard so you're then having to obviously pay quite a lot on furniture but apart from that, we've we've been quite lucky with not having to refurb or redecorate. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. And the other interesting thing is you live in a, I don't know whether it's rural or semi-rural area. How would you describe it? Yeah, it's quite a rural area. I suppose it's where I am is rural, but I'm quite close to a town. Mm. Um, so, yeah. And you're still making it work. And for those of you, for those who can't see, um, Ruby's in a lovely cottage, and you can see the old stone walls in the background. It's really gorgeous. Um, and if you do want to see Ruby, in, uh, sorry, am I saying Ruby? I am saying Ruby. <laughs> Where's that coming from? Ruby. <laughs> Evie, Evie is in this lovely <laughs> cottage and you can see her. We also have uh, the video from this episode is on the website at rent to rent success.com slash 118 for episode 118. But um, the reason why I'm bringing up the rural part of things, Ruby, is uh, Evie, oh my gosh, what is wrong <laughs> with me? Uh, <laughs> Evie is, um, people do ask me this question, does it work yeah. in um, rural areas? And you've yeah. got both both HMO and um yeah the thing I actually so although I'm based in Dorset my properties are based in Oxford 
um, right. which is obviously a very popular um, city. So that's actually where I'm born and from is Oxford. And then my partner and I moved to Dorset two years ago. Mm. Um, so the houses, they do really well because they are in such a busy location. Mm. So you've got the HMOs, which we aim to professionals. So you've got things like the BMW factory that's in Oxford. So things like that that are really big attract so many employees that that's who we house. Or you've got the JR, the Nuffield, huge hospitals. Um, and then you also, for the SA side, Oxford's really high up in like a tourist destination. So that, again, we always have people, because people always ask me, like, how am I filled up in January, February, the, the quieter months? But it's purely because Oxford is so strong all year round for the tourist market. Um, so I do have one in Bournemouth, which is in Dorset, which is close to me. Um, and I would say for that one, it's definitely more seasonal, whereas Oxford's all year round. It does do better in the summer, but it does well in the winter as well. Whereas the ones in Bournemouth, which is a service accommodation, is very seasonal. It does very well, say, April to September. Um, and then the rest of the month, it's quite quiet. So it does vary on your location. I think if you're in a city, you're going to be, let's say, London, Manchester, Oxford, they're always going to be busy because you've got people visiting all year round for many different reasons. Whereas if you're going more near the beach, you're going to be looking for more summer holidays, potentially. Yeah. And I'd love to talk to you a little bit more because you're doing both. Um, what would you say in terms of the profitability on, you know, after the costs on compared with between your HMOs and your service accommodation? Yeah, so I'd say the HMOs, they, well, how I see it is the HMOs make us less money, but it's more reliable. Obviously, a tenant could not pay. And that's always a possibility that you need to in to think about but say they do always pay you know at the end of each month you're going to have 500 from that property 600 from that property so on whereas and it's never going to change so unless you you do a rental increase or a rental decrease it's always going to stay the same um, as long as the tenants are paid and whereas with the service accommodation they make a lot more money but I, I don't know what I'm going to earn next month I don't know what I'm going to earn in July do you see what I mean it's always different so I suppose it's just what do you want out of it? Do you want something that's more steady but not as much money? Or do you, if you don't mind, then obviously the fluctuating prices, because in, say, July, you might make 2,000, whereas in January, you might make 1,000. So it just depends on what you're what you're looking for, really. Um, yeah. But I, that's why I like having a bit of both, because I feel as though I know what's going to come in from the HMOs, than the SAs, I can, because we've had it now, the SAs we've had for three years, I can now kind of predict how each month is going to work and have a rough idea of how, how they're going to perform each month. But like I say, it will differ every month. Yeah, and that's the other thing. Uh, no, the, and if you take it average over a year, and then maybe you don't have, even know this, um, after you take out all the costs of running your service accommodation business, are they still more profitable than your HMO side? Uh, yes, they are. Yes. Yeah. So the service accommodation, I would say, for my personal experience, have costed more to set up because I've needed, say, furniture. And also for me, I like to make them look a certain way. So I'm spending more money on like accessorizing them. Whereas with the HMOs, a lot of them we've taken on have already come furnished. So I haven't had to have that upfront cost. So the SAs might take longer to recoup the money I've put in, but after that's happened, they are making a lot more than mm. the HMOs. But like I said, I do find the HMOs handy just to have that steady income that you know will always be there as long as everything's okay. Um, and it's just nice to have that as well. But I would say the SAs do make more. Yeah. And I suppose it's that the um, essays as well, well, typically anyway, is more in terms of time, logistics. Yeah. But I was yeah. interested, you say you don't actually live near your properties. So about how far away do you live from yours? Yeah, so we're about, we're two and a half hours away. Mm -hmm. um, so it is, it, it, it does have its challenges, but my family and my partner's family both still live in Oxford. Um, and like I say, we are from Oxford, so we know the area really well. Yes. Um, so we do have a good lot of contacts within the area. Yeah. So most of it can be managed from afar, and then we just ring the relevant people that are needed. Yes. Um, 
it's obviously nice to go in yourself and check your properties and talk to tenants and stuff like that. So we do make an effort to go back at least once a month. But because my family are there, we we go back quite regularly. Um, yeah. And we go back for a period of time. So it actually makes it okay. It's definitely not as easy as when we were living in Oxford, but it's yeah. doable. So if people do want to move away, it is doable. It makes you more efficient. But I think you've said uh, um, uh, one of the things there that you said, you really know the area well and you have a network of people you can call on, which are the two uh, factors really, I think, for the success of outsourcing a business or managing it remotely. And the other one is obviously, obviously the experience that you now have of what needs to be done and when. So we've talked about the your your business 16 properties managed and I just asked you briefly before we went online I'd love you to talk about it more now is um, what kind of a team do you have to run um, the, the business you have now yeah of course it's actually the business is owned by my partner Flynn and, Flynn and I um, and we both so we own 50 percent each and so we run it solely together um, but then because, like I say, we do have a strong network of people, say when you need, there's a leak, we have a plumber, we have a carpenter, electrician, and we have two or three of each of the professions. So then when something is needed, so I will take the initial call, but then once it's, me, say it's a plumber, then I'll just ring our plumber and they'll go out. So it's kind of just managed by Flynn and I. Um, and so we are the point of contact and then we will just contact whoever's necessary. Yes, I love it. So that that's great because it just shows that, you know, you can do it. And when about, I was going to say you can't do it and work full time, but I'm guessing that you've now full time in property. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, we are. So I did start it. So when I was 19, I was in full time work and so was Flynn. Um, and then I did it alongside that for probably about a year. I can't remember specifically. Um, and then I went um, part-time property and into a part-time job and then once my partner and I moved we both went full-time into property so we kind of like staggered it so you can do it but I would say now if I was to go back to 16 houses and try and do it I don't know how that would work but, but when I was at work I had like one to three and that worked yeah I would say it depends also where you work because I worked in an office so I could answer my phone and I could answer emails Whereas, say, you're a nurse working night shifts on a ward, that might not be so easy. So it, I think it just depends on your your work, basically, your profession and how, how you can make that work alongside it. Absolutely. And you know what I, I find from interviewing so many people is everybody yeah. can make it work for them if they really want to. If they and want to, yeah. that drive behind them. I've been really loving the phrase, um, Dan Sullivan coined it, your future is your property. And I so admire people like you, Evie, who just at the age of 19 knew exactly what you wanted to create in the future. And you went all out doing it. You put all the books in place when you felt scared. Did you feel scared? Because some people don't actually. I did. Well, I suppose this is the thing. I think looking back, being that young actually really helped because I was quite naive to the real world. So yeah. I think that scaredness or what potentially other people have, like they worry about it. I just didn't worry. But I think it's because I didn't have any, I didn't have a house. I didn't have a mortgage. I didn't have children. I had no responsibilities. So I was like, you know what? What have I got to lose? Nothing. Just go for it. Yes. And so I suppose I wasn't scared. Whereas when I think now, I'm, I'm different now compared to what I was then. So although I know what I'm doing, I'm probably more cautious now than I was then because I have other responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, but yeah, of course, being scared is normal. Like, because you just don't, you don't know. It's the unknown, isn't it? So, yeah. Of course, I understand that people will be. And what advice would you give to other people? As I say, a lot of people listening to the show will be wanting to get started in rent to rent. Yeah, I would say just go for it. Like, if you want that thing and if you want to create that life for you, just go for it and don't let anything stop you. Because I think a lot of people, like, they want it and they love the idea of it, but then they won't put in the hard work and the determination to get that. They might see something like someone successful in rent to rent or property, and they'll just think, oh, well, I'll do that. And then as soon as they get that no, or as soon as they, they think, oh, actually, that's going to require X, Y amount of work, um, they, they stop and it puts them off. Whereas I think, you know what, if you want it, just go for it and work hard to, to get there. Um, I think that's one thing people do need to realise. You do need to work hard and you do need to put the hours in to, to get the rewards out of it. 
Yeah. But the thing I find, Evie, is um, I I really enjoy the work I do. Um, When I was at the bank, I, it didn't have, it didn't have as much meaning I know that some people do really enjoy their jobs at banks but uh, for me (laughs) it wasn't wasn't that thing and when I'm doing the work for our business and it just has meaning in itself and even the rubbish days where bad things happen I'm still so proud of myself that I put myself in this position that I now I'm in a place where I have these problems so I think that's it, really enjoying it, finding your passion. Because like I said, I realised from a young age I always wanted a business but didn't know what to go in. And then property kind of found me and I realised I'm actually really passionate about it. But I think if you are not passionate about something, then you're more likely not going to succeed in it. I think you need to love what you're doing and you need to feel passionate about it. Yeah, and I encourage people even to love the job they hate or the job they think they hate because... (laughs) There are things about it that you love, like you love getting paid and there will be aspects of the job. Maybe it's the routine, maybe it's the travel, maybe it's the people, but there will be one or two things, even if you really don't like it, there are a few things you really love about it. And it serves you to at least have some level of appreciation for that job, even if you're viewing it as a stepping stone before you take your next step and go into whatever it is that you're going to go into. In this case, it could be property, it could be rent to rent. Yes, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Evie, is there anything that I haven't asked you that you would love just to let people know uh, just before we close today? Um, no, I don't think so. I think we've covered, covered everything, really. Um, no, that, that's great. Thank you. Well, I want to just uh, thank you, Evie, for joining us and being such an inspiration. I really loved what you talked about and the way that you've been so intentional with your life. I it, It's just really touched my heart. And for you watching and listening, thanks as always for being here with us again for another episode. And if you, I'm sure that you will want to reach out to Evie and find out more. And you can go to that's propertygirlevie.com and Evie is spelled E-V-I-E. Or you can check Evie out where she does lots of property tips and information on uh, Instagram. And it's the same at, uh, sorry, at that property girl Evie. And she's got a lovely setting and she's up and up a hill with her partner and her dog. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> So uh, thank you so much. Do check Evie out. And if you have enjoyed what we've been talking about today and you do want to learn more about the Rent to Rent Success system, you can get the free guide and masterclass, renttorentsuccess.com slash guide, G-U-I-D-E. And until next week, believe bigger, be bolder, be a game changer. See you soon, guys. Bye for now.